I think the actual first official meetup of the Test Fanatic group, uh, just for some context, this was actually the merger of two other meetup groups from last year. Um, and so this will be our first one. So some other quick little things. Um, uh, those of you who've been members from the other groups will have another Calabash workshop. Uh, and I apologize for those who went in October. We lost the instructor uh, <laughs> the day before. Um, so the nice part is I'll actually have a book, hopefully about the same time, done with everything that I got out of the guy's head. And I will actually be double checking with Xamarin, who now uh, own Calabash. So if you're not familiar with mobile automation, uh, Calabash is a Ruby or C Sharp now uh, Cucumber implementation for mobile test automation. Um, they're actually here in the city, and they'll actually probably sometime this summer come out for a talk about some of the new stuff they have implemented before their next big event. And then at least I got confirmation this morning for our next meetup. It's going to be in April. Uh, part of the reason is I'm not going to be here the rest of this month, so I have no way to coordinate March. So the next one will be in April. Uh, Ghost Inspector uh, just got purchased by Runscope. A friend of mine uh, runs Runscope. He'll come in, or someone from there will talk about uh, Runscope, which is API test, uh, man test testing and monitoring. And the recent ac acquisition of Ghost Inspector is to add in uh, web-based testing into their suite of tools. So someone from that team will come out in April to have a chat about overall what it is they do and some of the testing tools they have available. Um, I will actually be trying out Ghost Inspector next month myself to give a full write-up of what my thoughts are. And I've used their RunScope API tool uh, at my previous job to write full-blown test suites. So it's not too bad. All right, so we're all here testing strategies for continuous delivery. It's actually an extension of a talk I just did uh, yeah, almost 10 hours ago over at um, Developer Week. So I'll post the, the PowerPoint on our meetup group. Uh, um, what's the name? I can't remember the name of the app now, but called me to try out their app to record the entire uh, presentation this morning that I did on building the CD pipe, what we are doing here to build out our continuous delivery pipeline uh, from scratch. So this one is a little bit more in detail on the testing portion, which I think I covered in like five minutes. So we'll go ahead and expand on to that. Uh, so always, I'd like to give a little context to understand why we do our designs the way we do. Uh, years ago, right, we all went into this waterfall mode. In fact, when I joined Macy's about three years ago, we had just left this model of uh, software delivery where we'd spend months in the development and go into testing and, and then finally a release cycle. And kind of did a little bit more like this where we created our iterations, our sprints, um, at four, like a two week, so each of these blocks represents a two week interval roughly. Our, our first attempt three years ago was we'd spent two, two weeks developing uh, the feature, we'd have dev stories, and then we'd have QA stories, which would execute on the second uh, cycle, where we'd spend two weeks testing the hell out of it, and then developers would just sit there and fix every defect that would come. And at the very end, we actually went into, which is not drawn right, but it's a four-week cycle, where we did a full-blown regression, um, merged all the code from all the different projects and in here. So back then, we had 40 different projects working on the same app, and so we kind of went into this model. Um, Oh, yeah. So we had challenge, and that's in the other talk, but we had some challenges with it in that model back then. So we made a lot of changes today where we had every developer or every development project had their own environment. I think that was our biggest change from what we had three years ago. Back then, we had one environment for Macy's and one environment for Bloomingdale's. And so whenever 40 teams would check in code, we didn't know who broke what. And so we made a lot of changes there. However, we kind of not paying attention, we kind of entered into this model that we're, um, at least my team is currently moving away from um, because of our, the way that we do development. Uh, developers got a little lazy in writing the unit test, uh, even the component test, which we're responsible for, and relied on our QA teams to write a lot of end-to-end -end tests, which, uh, as nice as it is, it's actually a challenge when you're trying to do CD. Uh, I can tell you, trying to get uh, regression libraries of 10,000 plus tests in some of the teams done in a day. Uh, it's not, hand, you know, can't be done because we'll have failures left and right and um, it'll take us three or four days to actually finish a full uh, testing cycle. So our, the way we developed caused us to have this problem. So even with this problem, 
diving in a little more, um, I found other issues. Even though we had this uh, agreed cycle, um, we still kind of went in this development mode, two weeks, manual testing for two weeks, handed it over to a different team to go off and write the automated test cases on that and then actually commit that. For a lot of groups, because we delivered at the end of commit test, it didn't. No one outside really cared how it got delivered. But internally, this four, this two, four, this eight-week process was kind of a pain for all the different teams involved. So what did we do? We made a lot of changes. So I'll walk through the pipeline a little bit. Um, so I mentioned earlier we added uh, infrastructure and a lot, ability to add a lot of uh, development and testing. So we now can do, as so I just picked feature A, B, and C, but we can do about, with our current infrastructure and our current tool set that we have, we can do about 150 different development projects at the same time for the same application. Um, we made some changes and are starting increasing on build, which is actually build and running, you know, so Maven clean, run everything, is what we do here at, the, at this stage where we run all the unit tests. Uh, then our deployments, and then we run a series of build acceptance tests um, that was a current strategy from QA, where you know these tests must pass before we even go any further, and then we'll sign off on if everything looks good, pass it and build and deploy. Right. So I think most people are familiar with this kind of flow. I don't have this slide twice. Oh, okay. So even with the, okay, so when we even with this flow, we made additional changes to the teams. We started trying to embed more experienced automation engineers to start writing tests faster. So tests became uh, manual and automated at the same time. Um, so then we can go into a full regression, and then we have a smaller regression for any fixes found uh, afterwards. Right? But still, our deployment time from start to finish of a feature was still eight weeks. Um, wasn't, uh, wasn't bad, wasn't good. It just everyone knew that if you wanted something, you were going to get it eight weeks later, and that wasn't as, as we start to get more competitive with other companies, you know, Walmart, you know, down there, I don't know, anyone from, anyone from Walmart Labs before I say anything? <laughs> I just realized. <laughs> so, no, I mean, we have, we have a lot of, uh, I have a lot of colleagues out there, but I think they're also going through the same uh, challenge of how do we get stuff out faster. So, we started looking at the problems about six, seven months ago. Uh, my team, uh, I have a smaller development team, um, which, from the outside world, actually doesn't have QA. So if anyone chats with Steve or me, just realize I don't actually have a QA team. I just have a, a team, um, which is hard for a lot of people who want to apply for my particular team. But when we first started, I f when I joined to this group eight months ago, we formed uh, a small set of features. And we realized our very first problem was way back here. As, uh, so I'm feature C. I go in and check in code. It passes all the unit tests we write. We go off and deploy, and then we failed. And it used to drive us crazy, because when we go look at these bat tests, the failures had nothing to do with anything we checked in, but because of some issue with an environment or a test. Um, and a lot of times, I'll be honest, we found it was the way the tests were written and failed for us that um, I wrote, uh, you know, we wrote a feature for this, had nothing to do with that, and we just could not get past this until either we talked to the QA teams to go fix these tests, or we'd actually go in and either A, fix the test, or B, actually hop into Jenkins and disable the job. Because <laughs> right? we were 100% confident as we were getting through it, we were just failing. I can, you know, there, are, there are times that we stayed until midnight because we couldn't get past this stage. That, you know, 11 o'clock, I'd make a call to my boss and say, look, I'm disabling this job. Do you need like, some kind of <laughs> email? And I can actually verify that this um, has nothing to do with the code we checked in. All right. And so that became kind of a really a problem where we were identifying, well, why are we developing code if the CI, the CD pipeline is supposed to protect us by actually knowing what to run? And we were just, you know. So I think after the fourth or fifth time that we were staying up till midnight to get past this and the third time calling, getting authorization to disable the jobs, well, I think by the third time we just stopped calling, we just disabled it. But um, we realized we had a minor problem. So we kind of changed our approach. We actually disabled for, for our test, we actually ended up uh, rechanging the job. So if it can actually from my team, depending on which group or which set of tests were written, so for those in the Java world, 
you'll notice we actually call a unique set of tests that matches what we cared about. So that was one of the changes that we did because we were just getting frustrated left and right of, you know, feature A is done, but we can't get past it because feature B and C broke our, you know, stuff and we're isolated. So we actually spent some time to rewrite uh, our Maven job and then go back into the test repo and rewrite a lot of the annotations so that um, we allowed only tests related to this particular story to be run. And then for our Ruby stuff, our, our Ruby tests that run for existing applications, we just ran the tags and made sure we tagged a bunch of uh, feature files with the story that we wanted. And so if you have any questions, feel free to ask. Um, but that was basically the first thing we did because we were just getting kind of a little frustrated. You know, tests that were running had nothing to do with other code changes. So we did that for a while. And then what we discovered was it's actually not too bad. Cool. Yeah. So what we discovered was now that we had this, uh, the Jenkins job is actually working through and actually picking up the right test to go. And we were actually, you know, now we're passing. Well, we also realized we probably should be very careful with that, that command. So what we ended up doing is we ended up changing how our, uh, our team works. So for the last three months, my uh, team has actually changed. Um, we had a certain set of rules. Right? Features had to be done in five days. What was my goal? So we did a lot of things. We actually went through this process first. We actually went through a story, walked through, looked at what we were, what we were building and say, eh, break that smaller. And we were breaking things so small that they were literally done in a day. Like if it was a database change, that became its own feature. Um, then we made a small change to the automated tests. We actually, so in that Jenkins job, not only does it run that command, but if it returns no test found, we actually stop the whole thing and send off an email saying, hey, something. We, you didn't, uh, you don't have any tests. I'm not even going to bother building. Right? So we actually scan ahead now uh, for a lot of the story. So it actually changed my team's behavior to actually get the test done first, right, in the true ATD fashion uh, to get it done before anything. And then once we were off, we went off and started checking in the code. And uh, a lot of times the thing, the one big change, behavior change we did was tell everyone the test that we write the first time isn't going to be perfect. Um, and I think that's how our other teams got to the point where they write the automated tests after the development code, was they didn't want to write tests that were bad. Here we went, oh, here's a mock-up. You know what it's going to look like. Write a bunch of tests. You know Selenium. You know the commands. Eh, get close. And I think we were about 85% accurate um, in writing those automated tests, just because, one, we knew the application, and two, uh, we were lucky to have a PDM, a product manager, that had all, enough details in the screenshot uh, or mock-ups that we could actually go off and write without ever writing any of the code. So that was probably our biggest change uh, to the team in that, in that fashion. So once we got that, we spent a lot of time cleaning up the functional tests. I think the now, from the story walkthrough to the review build for us now, it takes us about three days, three to four days that we get that far. So that's a big drastic difference from you know, two weeks of development and two weeks of, of testing. And then we spent a, a day cleaning up our functional tests. So a lot of cleaning up the uh, element IDs. Um, but more so, we focus, and I wish this tells me what the next slide is. But um, well, basically this, we actually started to remove a lot of the functional tests when we compared it to the unit tests. Um, I know for the stat for one of the uh, features we developed, we went from 15 acceptance tests and dropped it to six or seven. Because we found out eight of those tests did exactly the same thing as the unit test. And then we realized, OK, take that out, because that's 15 minutes runtime when everything's exactly covered um, at the unit test level. And so we now, at least for one project team or two project teams, we've changed to this model. So we kind of had our new goal in mind, right? We're now trying to get the word to our teams to switch how we do our testing. It's kind of scary for QA to go, wait, you have no end-to-end -end test. There's no UI test. But what, we can, what we're actually finding out is, as we start going through this review process and pushing tests down, we actually have the ability to go, now our QA teams can go off and write real meaningful tests that go from one side of the product all the way to the other in a much more critical fashion than we could before. So um, I'm part of the merchant systems, so I'm not on the website. So to give you an idea, to get a product onto the website is actually a lot of work. And so many, we have, I think, last at least five main systems to get that guarantees the product will go up on the, on the site. And now that we've removed a lot of the, you know, I think one of the most annoying tests I saw all the time was log into the application and do a search and see if it returns back a result. I mean, almost 60 something tests do that. Right? And we found out, get rid of those. And so now we actually have teams focus on 
Okay, now I have a product. I'm going to do something in the product and then make sure it updates to the site. So now we, now that we have more focus in that area, we can actually start delivering our internal systems to be a little bit more stable than we have been uh, in the past because we focus in other areas. Our next biggest thing, once we started move, once we discovered we were moving code or moving our tests down into the unit level, was we actually had to go off and measure our unit test coverage. Um, we used to do that in the past, and what it was it was just a maintenance effort. So we, I think at some point we stopped doing it because again we ended up relying on the on the functional test that we made a conscious effort. So this is just one of the snapshots on one of the projects I'm on, where we spent a lot of time to get close to 100% test coverage. All right. And one of the things we learned after going through this exercise is we're still going to ship with bugs. Yeah, and it has nothing to do with that yellow line, but it's just something we just learned over time that we only test whatever code we actually have. Um, if we don't code for edge cases, we don't code for you know, null pointers or anything like that, our code coverage tool doesn't tell us anything. Uh, yeah, cool. So in this particular case here, it turns out we wrote the wrong test. <laughs> or we have the wrong functionality in this particular app. It had nothing to do with what we intended. And, and the whole time we left this code in here until we were actually doing uh, coverage. So this couple of lines, it turns out, no matter what we did, we were never going to hit those lines. I mean, other than directly calling it um, as it was intended, uh, it turned out we should have put this with another product or another service. But for the longest time, we left this code in here for a while going, I think we need it, but we turned out we never really used it. So that was one of the things we learned with code coverage. It actually gave us a little insight into going, huh, shoot, she didn't do that. All right, so walk through what we're actually currently going through today. Uh, so the way our current world works is we check in a bunch of things uh, to a story branch or a feature branch. We go off and you know, build off a dynamic environment. So if I feature A, I'll have environment A. We go off and build it. And right now, we still run those tests that potentially could fail that we have nothing to do with it. But the problem is we can't change it because Oh, is it at, the t at the time, it's, a, it's 150 different teams. Not everyone has tests to go through. So we actually still have to run uh, those tests. And then Hyperloop is just a name that we just kind of gave it a code word. Um, it actually goes into, uh, sorry, this one actually goes into version one, which we use, or we're using, to find out whether who actually committed that code, if it comes from my team, to go a different path right now. Because we have a, set of, a separate set of requirements. We go off and uh, extend the environment a little longer because we have a longer, usually we have a longer set of tests. And then we execute what we're calling right now the smart job because it's going off and picking off the test cases based on what it's reading in version one and JIRA and so on, saying, okay, these are the tests that I need to run for this feature branch. And then you often notify. And then at some point up here, somebody has to actually do a, dive in and do a code review. Um, you, you know. For us, it's mostly anyone who didn't actually develop the feature or the test. So anyone else who, isn't, who didn't commit into any of that in the feature branch goes off and does the review. And today, we'll merge that code to master. We'll do a couple deployments. Uh, current process to the left, um, because we didn't want to break our existing pipeline for most of the features that go into the regular QA cycle that we do daily. But then for a little bit smarter on our side, we go and start running the targeted regression um, or deploying to a dynamic environment because we don't check in that we don't check in that much uh, many features a day, and uh, we execute that smart. You can't see it here, but we call it smart prime, and that's the collection of um, basically going back to Jira in version one and finding all the components, and hoping that we have made some effort to tag all our tests properly so that we know which tests to run based on that component, or the test class. And then in our case, we execute the back tests again just to make sure we didn't screw up right now, and then target off to the mini regression. <laughs> okay, you get some food, Johannes. <laughs> so, targeted regression, that's an interesting one that we, we're still spending some time rewriting today. Um, and we're tying everything right now to Git. When we go into the Git commit, we'll take a look at Jira or sorry, we'll find the name of the story or the story identifier. We actually have, or will have, we have some of it now, but 
Uh, we'll actually execute a bunch of API calls to Jira, but we need to go rewrite this down to version one and try to get the component names and pass this name down into our testing framework. So earlier you saw the Maven command or the Cucumber command with the story branches. It's basically replacing those annotations and uh, tags with the appropriate components or list of components. Uh, at least for Cucumber, um, we can do multiple. I don't think we have the multiple working yet for uh, the JUnit framework. So where we're heading to now, or very soon, is a much smaller version of what you saw earlier. Um, I can tell you the previous diagram took about two and a half hours to run through. This one's taking us roughly about an hour, hour and 15 right now to get through this. And I think right now part of our problem is the targeted regression job is still not uh, picking up the right test. And so we're running extra tests. All right, so our last, our last, uh, we made all these changes to the framework or to Jenkins. Um, basically we have one minor problem and I'm gonna go ahead and pick one here. Oh, let's pick the last test that passed. It is test results. All right, let me go find something bigger. But anyhow, let me switch into this view. Being able to aggregate all the test results to kind of correlate back and forth um, with what we have. So for example, knowing, I don't know, I can't click on here. So knowing the failures here, and then let's see the previous job had it, right? I think the previous failure. And then identifying whether these two test failures were the same between these two builds or were they different. Um, without having, right now we manually go into Jenkins and click and say, oh, these are the three test cases that fail. Go click previous build. Oh, they're still the same three ones. This, so it means hopefully someone's still working on it. Um, or it's a completely different set of test cases. But imagine, I'll just give you a, a peek into our Jenkins. And imagine, if, I don't know if the right tab opened, but imagine now you have to go look across all your applications and figure out what was the history of all the different test failures going back and forth. So that's our, you know, that, that was actually our biggest challenge even after making all these changes. Luckily, although I don't have a copy working, where did it go, here, keynote. Luckily, we actually uh, partnered up with Exhibia Labs to, uh, to build out a new test, or not to build out, to, we took their existing test reporting dashboard and they've actually started working on integrating uh, into our CI or CD pipeline. So unfortunately, I couldn't get the real one up and running, but I'll have a local copy running. And I also have Brian back there in case I, uh, from Exhibia Labs, in case I've got this wrong. Because it's actually a different version than one I was used to. <laughs> a lot different, but. Uh, like for one, there's a login page. <laughs> no, the first version that we had didn't have a login page, so that was, uh, luckily, it's the same password that the other tools that we're using has. So this is basically our new, what's going to become once we hook in Jenkins, everything into our new dashboard. Um, one, of our, one of our biggest challenge is if you had an application, we might have 40 different jobs that represent different uh, components for testing. We'd have to read all of those to go figure out which ones actually broke. Um, I'm gonna hopefully pick one. We have a lot of features here. Where is it? Detail? No, what happened to my, uh, sorry. Where's my, I'm sorry, did, Brian, did we move the diff reports out of here? Okay, well, I'll find something. Yeah, okay. So one of the biggest things that we had, oh, I don't have the plugin on here. Is that what it is? Okay. So, <laughs> okay, no worries. I'll f so what we have now, or what we have soon, is we actually can tell, you know, all, here's your basic failures and um, pass. But the plugin I don't have installed on this version is we'd have a little graph here, um, basically a similar bar chart that actually tells us which test passed last time. Or, sorry, these are tests that, so imagine these are tests that passed last time that failed today, or the, this time, 
and those that failed last time which passed today. So that was probably one of the biggest enhancements that we have now is that clear visibility between what happened between every single build. And imagine now this is actually 20 or 30 different Jenkins jobs executing 30 sets of tests and actually sending it all into one dashboard. Currently today we have to go read every single Jenkins jobs or the, the testing teams read every single jobs and kind of aggregate it themselves and some you know, it's a mystery to me how they aggregate it all up, but to be able to track all the different versions of commits where we now have a nice little build where I can tell, you know, which ones go. And then I can quickly look and see, okay, of the failures, you know, the admin, right? I can actually quickly tell, did we make changes to the admin code that there should be any deltas, right? Ideally, um, I think the vision for this is ideally things that pass or failed should be zero if we didn't touch that code. Those components shouldn't be here. So if I only touch the, you know, the integration service, then all these guys, if we, did our, if we did our coding right or our test right, should not even have any graphs on there. So that's kind of the goal there. And then diving in some more with Excel uh, tests is even more. We can actually drive down to the test case and actually look at the details. All right, so we have that in, we have that in Jenkins with the JUnit test where you can just scroll down, but for us, at least for what I'm finding is looking at a high level, I can quickly make uh, quick glances to see across the board for the entire application. If I know that this commit, that this feature that came in only touches these portions of the application, I can actually quickly scan through these pie graphs and visually just do a quick inspection and make a decision. One of the, so let's even drive, does it drive down even more? Doesn't do it. Okay, so this is, sorry, Brian. This is as far as this version I have goes, right? I can't. Dive down further. Okay. All right. So now I can actually look at the history of the uh, individual test cases. Um, you'll notice down here we kind of have a flakiness graph. It shows our our test execution as a particular test over time, and we haven't. I'll be honest. We haven't played with this one too much. Can I ask how? <laughs> Okay. Okay. Does everyone hear that? Or okay, cool. And then we have duration and overall failure results. I think that might actually be the last slide. Let me see. Yeah. Okay. So all in all, that's actually the testing strategy that we're doing on the merchant system that we're working on for 2015. Um, I'll leave it open to questions. I'm also running out of power, looks like. Yeah, way out in the back. So my team's test suite, sure, oh yeah, no problem. So the question is, oh, sorry, I'm on the mic. Uh, the question is uh, percentage of time uh, maintaining tests. So for my team, it's probably no more than 10, 15 minutes a day. Um, we wrote them, we run through, uh, uh, actually we run through an older version of Excel tests and so we can quickly look and we actually get rid of tests that have been flaky or perceived flaky. So we are spending, you know, I don't see anyone spending more than 10, 15 minutes a day unless we have a really doozy of a, of a failure that we're, you know, worst case a day. But on average, I don't think today, you know, I think I asked someone, we haven't even looked at the test in a long time because we have this report that says, yeah, everything's good or everything fails quickly and we know where, where we tie to. I mean, I can find out what everyone else's test time is, but I know for my team it's not that long. Um, it's actually a very small portion of the day. Oh, Do you write your unit tests before writing the production code? Um, kind of depends, back and forth. I have bosses here laughing because we both wrote the actual code recently before the unit test, but it kind of depends on our crunch time. Um, we're trying to get diligent in it, but as in our workflow, we actually have to have the unit test before we even get the lead approval. So whenever we actually do it, we're not too strict on it. It's actually in the approval process. Um, we're hoping sometime this year to actually have an automated gate process that goes, your unit test coverage was actually worse than last time based on percentage of code checked in and tests. But for right now, because that lead approval step, um, at least on mine, pretty diligent on making sure there's unit test in. 
So after you've identified that your functional tests were the event, or that your functional tests were the event, your unit tests, mm -hmm. how has that changed your workflow in terms of creating new test cases? Unfortunately, it hasn't really changed our workflow on new test cases because these are new features that we're not, from a technical standpoint, we don't know. All we've, the only gain that we get out of it is that very first commit might have taken, let's say, 20 minutes to run the test suite. But by the time I go into lead approval, probably the total runtime of the uh, functional test, so like the one that was from 15 to 7, so that went from 25 minutes. I think the runtime for that was 6 minutes. All right, so there's a slight difference when we get rid of redundant tests in that level. Because, again, opening up a browser, waiting for the browser to communicate, all these little things, especially when, for that first feature, we found that almost everything could be done. Uh, it's actually, we actually redid everything in DB unit, since a lot of it was really more calling a database query to duplicate it, dupl create another um, entry. So we got to rid of a lot of the tests, right? open up the browser, click duplicate, and go through that whole process. Ah, interesting. So we're currently building out where we have, besides the code coverage running, where Excel test actually allows us to put a little bit of algorithm. Um, we can actually put some logic into it. So I think our first version right now says 90% passing. We'll make some judgment off of it. But as we actually start walking, you know, start building this thing through, we'll actually start writing additional logic to say, these set of tests must pass or um, as we learn through, I mean, one of the things that's nice with my team is we also deal with production issues. So when we get production, we also go through the same uh, pipeline and build tests, and we can actually mark those as super critical or never have that happen again. Or you know, this guy over here is not paying attention to me is uh, gonna go have my neck out. <laughs> so, so we are currently writing a lot of uh, um, Python scripts, or we're le well, actually we're learning Python so we can write the scripts into Excel tests to actually start doing a little logic on test results. Um, I don't think it's the number of bugs. It's the stupid bugs <laughs> that make it to production. Um, we'll never, at least I hope I'm not accounted to releasing bug-free code. Uh, they're just going to be things that we don't know, but something as stupid, you know, I don't know. Yeah, like, yeah, I can't log in, or you have a null pointer that you didn't know, you know, your edge case, you didn't, you know, obviously, you didn't, you know, entering zero for a price, right? We'll, we'll get dinged for that, but something way out there where, you know, we just didn't see it, I think we're okay as long as we can, again, through our new CI, CD pipelines, if we can start getting to the point where we can deploy the next day, I don't think that people are going to get too mad at us if we miss something. Sure. No, today it's not. Well, right now it's actually triggered by a commit when I check in a piece of code. So there's no button I actually push. Um, I, I'm sorry? Yeah, one manual action of me checking in a piece of code. I do actually have a red button I'm actually programming into right now so that if it all goes green or something, I can press that button and have it deploy to a... Uh, unfortunately, the red button I have is, yeah, everyone's complete. yeah, everyone wants the giant red button. Right now, it's a tiny little button. I think I bought the one from Geek Tools, and it's only like this big. <laughs> okay, it's, uh, <laughs> well, so our solution right now is um, I'm actually going off and writing an iPad app, and I just put a red circle. <laughs> um, although I am toying with the idea of fingerprint, <laughs> um, not just pushing the button. Yeah, we could print our own button, but you know, it's probably cheaper to buy me an iPad. <laughs> so, any other questions? Yeah. Do you have app situations when everything works and your app is third environment and then you see the production and it's just not working? Yeah. <laughs> yes, we do. Um, we do. Um, we, uh, we, well, I'll be honest, we do have it because the way we, um, one of the challenges actually in my previous talk, uh, this morning talks about how we actually started to get a little more controlled on our dev development environments. So to overcome that challenge, we're actually playing right now with Docker to start containerizing um, our apps so that development, testing teams, and so on um, 
will have the exact same piece, everything. Right now, it's slightly different when I go build something locally on my laptop and when I build something in CI. When we actually hand it over to release engineering, it's a slightly different build in terms of environment configurations, uh, network setup is slightly different. And then, so there's a lot of slight differences. Um, I know for like one feature, our configuration files were completely different. Right? But we never knew that they had a different set of configuration files, right? So we're working our way to get a little better at it. Yeah? Sorry to ask so many questions. I know, that's fine. I know you're from a testing company. <laughs> I'm sorry? How similar are your environments that QA is taking? So I think QA is half of the, in terms of size, is half of production right now. Uh, my CI environments, where I actually do a lot of my work, is probably one fifth or one sixth. Um, but ideally, we're trying to get to the point with Docker that we don't really care the size difference. We, you know, the piece of code and the configurations grow uh, to it. And that's what we're trying to shoot for this year. Yeah, we actually do. We actually just started doing performance testing within CI. Um, we actually this last year we spent a lot of time um, testing two different sets of code. We didn't know which one was better, so we redid Jenkins to spin up two environments to compare two pieces of code to see which one actually was a better performance improvement. Um, right now, this year we're going to focus on trying to get more of that performance testing daily in CI. Um, right now, again, it's unfortunate, it's my project team since I also have a performance engineer who can go write these scripts and uh, using JMeter. And, you know, uh, Jenkins has the performance plugin and Excel test, which I haven't got a test yet, but has a JMeter enhancement as well. So we're, uh, when I come back from vacation, we'll actually start implementing that inside the pipeline on a regular check, uh, probably not every check-in basis right now because uh, infrastructure, but at some point per check-in. Yeah. So when you split up these builds to have different parts of your laptop that they're running on, do you ever run a full integration test where you're running multiple of these like small integration builds? Um, so okay. So to when I say when we were splitting up these builds, they were actually the same functionality. Okay. We were testing to see, you know, we had a problem with the save, and you know, it takes ten seconds. Two of us argue, oh, if we do it this way, it's going to be faster. If we do it this way, it's going to be faster. So to prove it, we actually spent off and uh, wrote Jenkins jobs to actually build two separate environments with two separate pieces of code and to do comparisons between the two. Um, I, mean, I don't I know the site's down, but we can actually see comparison-wise which of the two and kind of got competitive between the folks. Like, oh, mine was faster than yours. Um, in terms of the individual pieces, um, it's kind of what we're doing now with the uh, individual features running a smaller set of tests uh, against that. And then at some point when we hand it over to release engineering, they run the full regression. Any other questions? Yeah, go ahead. Well, okay. <laughs> so for me, a full regression is running the set of tests that actually adds value to the code changes I've made. I at least, I must first, before I can do that, have a known baseline that this is a, I know to, you know, close to 100%, this is good. I have a reliable regression library, and now I'm just doing incremental changes. A um, lot of other teams are doing full regression as run every test you have. Um, I'm kind of against that approach because um, a couple years ago I instrumented the build to measure what they were actually testing. And even though they ran every single test that they had, they covered 45% of the app. So I'm trying to find a, right now, my team's trying to find a balance of we're 100% fully tested and not saying 100% uh, regression. I'm trying to separate that out by providing data that says, here's the test, here's the code change, here's the code coverage based on that change. And within the high probability, these are the tests that we had to run to validate it. It's a mixture. So code, like as I mentioned earlier, code coverage only covers what I've got coded. If I didn't co code edge cases or anything, I still have to somehow test that manually. Uh, kind of more of the, the metric I'm shooting for this year is, kind of to what I um, said earlier, 
how many bugs that I actually have in production. You know, um, I think what I'll try to propose is less patches um, and higher reliability of what um, at least my project team deploys is you know, without fault. So, but yeah, I mean, as I've, you know, I can post more as we, as we go through that discovery this year of what's, what's of value. I'll keep posting it in the meetup group as well. Any others? Okay, well, thanks everyone. Um, you feel free if you want to ask some questions you do want to ask in front of the group. And uh, like I said, thanks for coming to the first Test Fanatic Asheville meetup. And look forward to seeing you guys in April when uh, Ghost Inspector is here. All right, thank you.